Good afternoon, uh, everybody. I should almost say good evening. Uh, it's wonderful to have everyone here today on a beautiful, beautiful spring day to uh, talk about important things. We must be doing something right because we've got a very distinguished crowd here. We have a Chancellor Emerita, uh, Greta Chambers. We've got the Provost, uh, still the Provost, Tony Massey. We've got the Vice President, uh, Vice Principal of Research, uh, Rosie Goldstein. We've got the Dean of Medicine and Vice Principal of Health Sciences. And I don't think we've ever been able to mobilize quite that uh, array of senior administrators for our talks before. So welcome to everyone, but particularly to uh, those. This is the 18th uh, Sandra Goldberg Lecture. And uh, we're so grateful to the Goldberg family because they have allowed us to bring to our community a series of outstanding people who have contributed to our knowledge uh, and probably shaped our attitudes to a great degree. Uh, and we believe that this afternoon will be no uh, exception. The Goldberg family, uh, Lynn Goldberg, daughter of Sandra Goldberg, is here. As uh, Neil McDonald is supposed to be here, I haven't seen him yet. Uh, he treated Sandra Goldberg when she uh, died of cancer. And uh, as a result of that relationship, this lectureship was uh, established <clears throat> under the sponsorship of the Council on Palliative Care. Uh, I'm the co-chair with Cappy Flanders. Uh, its mandate was projected before uh, for your edification. We basically provide uh, educational activities to the professional and non-professional community around us and a real emphasis on the community, uh, trying to help people learn how to cope uh, with death and dying. And we serve as a very strong advocate uh, for palliative care at the local, at the provincial, and at the national level. Uh, and we're so happy to have Madame Yvonne here, who, uh, of course, uh, has done so much more than we have, actually. Uh, this is, uh, again, going to not be a formal lecture, quite obviously. Uh, we're going to have a dialogue uh, between distinguished people, uh, and uh, that will be moderated by a very, very uh, experienced moderator. Uh, Veronique uh, Yvon uh, is, uh, has been the member of the National Assembly for Joliet since December 2008. She was elected uh, under the banner of the Parti Québécois in three consecutive elections. Uh, she holds degrees from McGill University in both civil and common law as well as a master's in political analysis from the London School of Economics. She has uh, also acted as a political advisor and deputy director of the offices of two ministers of justice, Serge Menard and Lyda Goupil. Uh, original instigator and vice president of the special commission on the question of dying with dignity, when still in opposition, she was called upon to pilot the legislation on end of life care as the minister responsible from September 7, uh, 2012 till April 2014, when of course the liberals were in power. A, uh, I think a very wonderful expression of bipartisan uh, service. Uh, during the same period, she was appointed minister in charge of social services uh, and youth protection policies. Uh, she spanned the two uh, administrations, as I should have said. Uh, and she distinguished herself by bringing forward the first policy paper on fighting homelessness and bringing public attention to those affected by aut autism or suffering from mental deficiencies, as well as studying the need to increase the funding of community working groups. Uh, since April 24th, she's been the opposition critic on questions of culture, communications, higher educations, and end of life care. You know, when you look at what she's done, you realize that people really can accomplish something in public service. It's quite wonderful and quite impressive. Uh, we tend to get a little jaded sometimes, but we mustn't forget that. Harvey Shipper, uh, I'm going to have some trouble because very small print here for an old guy, uh, is both an engineer and a physician who's combined the disciplines to bring innovation to health and life sciences sector from the research bench to the bedside and to public policy. His career has bridged five continents as a cancer specialist, 
innovator, health systems designer, businessman, and advisor to government, academe, and the corporate sector. As a physician, he was professor of medicine and director of the regional cancer care system in Manitoba, established the WHO Collaborating Center for Quality of Life Research in Cancer, which catalyzed patient-centered outcomes research on a global basis. He has helped design cancer programs around the world. Currently, he's professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. He has served as a corporate vice president of NBS, a strategic portfolio. His broad experience over more than 35 years has ranged from the bench to the bedside to national and international health systems with a particular focus on healthcare delivery and policy. During his tenure at MDS, he was deeply involved in health venture capital allocation and has advised startups and established ventures ever since. His particular skill has been setting each initiative in the broad context of healthcare environment. His work with governments and large healthcare systems uh, focuses on future orientation and transformation. And as our moderator, we have our Dean of Law and Wainwright Chair in Civil Law. Uh, Daniel Jutra uh, has, has teaching and research interests in civil law and comparative law, and he now conducts research into the law of obligations from a comparative and pluralist perspective. He's also pursuing research projects on judicial institutions and civil procedures. He's frequently invited to speak on these issues. Interestingly enough, from 2002 to 2004, he was on leave from the faculty and acted as the personal secretary to the Chief Justice of Canada, uh, the Right Honorable Beverly McLaughlin, in the position of Executive Legal Officer of the Supreme Court of Canada. He's a former director of the Institute of Comparative Law and has served as Associate Dean Admissions and Associate Dean Academic in the faculty, and he is our moderator, and I am delighted to turn the podium uh, over to him. He will run the podium from his chair. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Cruz. This is wonderful. Um, you've done all the difficult work, and now I have the pleasant work to do. So welcome uh, to McGill. Welcome to this wonderful event. I want to remind you that we're here sitting on the podium because the temptation to watch the screen, I think, is, uh, is unavoidable. I mean, all of us like to watch TV. Uh, and at some point, if you don't pay attention, we might lose eye contact, and that's really disorienting for people who are uh, speaking at an event like this. So, uh, welcome. A few words on uh, <coughs> the order of the day on how we're going to proceed. So, instead of having speeches delivered by uh, what academics like to refer to as talking heads, uh, which I think is also used in the media, we thought we'd make this a bit more lively by having a conversation between our two guests. And my task is to take as little space as possible. So I will try to disappear as much as possible once I've launched your two guests in this conversation. I can assure you that will not be very difficult. We met for an hour just before uh, this uh, event uh, begin, uh, began, and uh, I had to stop them, actually. Um, but it was very civil, as you will, uh, as you will quickly realize. Madame Yvon uh, va intervenir en français. So if there are... Uh, Yvon will intervene in French. So if there's... Yet, uh, a little machine out there, uh, uh, an earpiece that will enable you to follow uh, the full uh, scope of the debate. And as we were sitting, we uh, agreed to do this in an informal way, so I will refer to our two uh, speakers by their first name, if I can get myself to do that, and they've agreed to do the same. And then when you ask questions at the end, you can choose, I guess, to... Uh, refer to them by their first name. So questions will be um, uh, um, uh, uh, raised by the audience after the conversation, uh, probably 45 minutes of conversation, then we'll open the floor for questions, and you've all received a little card on which you can write your question. Given the size of the audience and the number of people who wish to ask questions, we felt that it would be more efficient to gather the questions on pieces of paper that I will then sort, try to gather together on similar topics and raise with our speakers, and we will end promptly after about 15 minutes of question and answer. So in the spirit of launching the conversation, I thought I would begin by uh, showing that our speakers are actually in agreement on much of the issues that we're going to talk about uh, tonight, and in particular, in agreement about 
one aspect of this issue, which is the importance of, of thinking of assisted dying, which is the word uh, that is now used in uh, the Quebec bill that addresses end-of-life care. Think of assisted dying as part of the continuum of end-of-life care. And I know that both of our speakers think of this very carefully. Perhaps I will start with Veronique, who can explain why it was so important for the Quebec legislature to tie together the concept of assisted dying and the scope of end-of-life care. Oui, c'est... Well, yeah, that's a very good uh, entry into this topic because the legislation in Quebec is quite unique in its own way. In the world, it's the first legislation that really deals with the question on a whole spectrum, so a continuum of care. And the law, in spite of all the media attention that was given to it on the question of medical help to die, that's the uh, expression retained in the law, that it, the attention is really on the end-of-life care. That's the title of the bill. Why we made that choice is because the end of care of life, uh, sorry, end of life is not a, a, a it is a, a step. What we wanted through the law is to accompany as best possible, responding best possible to the needs, the particular needs of the specific need of each person who is ending their lives with uh, something appropriate to their circumstances. And this is why we want to give rights for palliative care, which we know will respond to the most of the needs uh, and on that spectrum where there are palliative care, the palliative sedation, uh, even the possibility of having, of using uh, medically assisted uh, death. And so uh, even the, uh, the question of, of uh, there are times when the best palliative care does not respond to everything. The settings that you think that the focus on assisted dying that comes from the Supreme Court decision in Carter and the discussions that uh, took place in Quebec in, the, in respect of the legislation that was just mentioned, that all of this debate has actually distracted us from the significance of end-of-life care and palliative care more broadly. What do you mean by this? Well, in preparing for uh, today, and I must say I'm very honored to be here, and a number of my mentors are in the audience, so, you know, I prepared a little more carefully because all my teachers are there, you know. Um, and I'm going to get marked. Um, uh, no. <laughs> anyway, uh, as I thought about this, really, the fundamental issue is why do we find ourselves in this spot? You know, if you take a broad historical view of medicine and go way, way back, uh, Socrates started this conversation going, and he wasn't the first. And the issue of uh, ending life early, of suicide, of assisted suicide, whatever the the phraseology is, goes back a very, very long time, and it seems to go up and down and up and down. And my perception has been that it comes to the fore because of conditions in the community that make people nervous that they're going to be left alone, that they won't be able to receive the support they need, that uh, they will be, if you will, to oversimplify the phrase, uh, be left to suffer alone in one way or another. So uh, I'm, uh, you know, uh, honored to be sitting beside Veronique. We've had one phone call and now an hour and a half conversation and realized that we have a lot of common ground because I think we both come from that same position. What is there out there? And because that there's something out there, Quebec has led the world in creating a piece of legislation that addresses not only the notion of assisted suicide, which the media has jumped on, but what do you do to assure that people that they are not going to be left wanting uh, at time of real uh, existential need of, uh, when they are suffering? And uh, that caused me to go around, and, and in fact, I interviewed, uh, I suppose, a collective of 200 people from politi senior politicians to hospital administrators in, in advance of this. And, we really came to the conclusion that what this bill can do is galvanize not just Quebec, but the country to say, we need to understand the needs of our community at times like this and make sure the services are there. And that implies changes in the way we educate our medical profession, the way we administer our medical profession, the way our hospitals work, the way insurance companies work, and the way we as individual persons, all of whom are going to travel this road at some point, uh, prepare, come to terms for this kind of conversation. So 
I'm pleased that we did not say, hey, we're going to have a big debate about whether it's morally right or morally wrong, because you're never going to resolve that issue. There are going to be some people who say, under no circumstances should we allow this. And there are other people who are going to have a different view. The real issue is, how do we relieve the angst in the community? How do we make the need for this as little as possible? And uh, those are very powerful um, impetuses for making progress across the whole healthcare scene. So you've got it as a piece of legislation. I can tell you that when I, uh, you know, in Ontario, now I, people come to me and say, well, what are we going to do about this? College of Physicians says to me, what are we going to do about this? How do we have the conversation? Well, guess what? We didn't have the conversation mm -hmm. before. I think that, that I can add something here, which is the interest of having the, the uh, dialogue with the, con with the population. The way we did it, we always did it in a, a broad perspective. And the law, the bill, as the process, started from the perspective of the person, the person who was the end-of-life situation and how we could uh, accompany this person as best as possible and therefore all the principles that flowed from uh, in the light in the, in the law, the rights that are there, and there's a reality behind all of this that is there a will for people to be able to have an a, a company, optimal a, a accompaniment and control even on the end of life situation, uh, just to reflect on palliative care. The, the will to be able, in the community, promote as much as possible the care, how, homes for palliative care as well as places in hospitals where care is given as well in the places uh, also at home. Some people want to have, have palliative care at home. And so know that all those are fundamental possibilities and at the heart of the whole discussion and dialogue of accompanying people at the end of life. And so we agree on the fact that training and formation has to be improved. That palliative care has to be come, come earlier. I, I'm in a proletariat of pastoral uh, of, of care. I think that the, we have to look at this much more broadly, that the doctors, the nurses, the social workers, the people have to internalize all this because uh, we, we need to deal with the people. But let me point to one place I think where you disagree. So I know that you don't really feel that palliative care can cover all possible cases, that there are some limits to palliative care. And they may be near or far, but there's a point at which, I think in your perspective and the perspective that animates legislation, where something else needs to be done. Am I right? Wait. Yes, with all the work that we did, the, the hearing the experts looking at the evolution of medicine, uh, of society itself and also the, of rights or law, not, we became aware that there was a need uh, for people to be sure that if the sen worst scenario uh, uh, might occur, uh, which just doesn't happen, but it might happen, uh, where people are experiencing heavy, heavy suffering, uh, is, is suffering and pain that is not controllable. Uh, if that happens, there has to be able to have an option, an exceptional option that's very uh, circumscribed, but respond to this question of accompanying people till the end of their life and uh, to make sure that there's no suffering and that responds to their needs and that these persons still feel to be the persons that they were during their whole lives through sickness because we respect also their perspective, their opinion, and the fact that suffering can, in certain circumstances, not be uh, surrounded. Uh, this is not me, uh, uh, but as a legislator, I can't decide this. But having talked to hundreds of people through Quebec uh, with experts also, and there are a lot of people who said that, yes, they had they saw, they, they saw their child, their parent, their partner had palliative cares, but in, as in all cases, even medicine has limitations, and palliative medicine also has limitations. And this was our, I would say, our conviction that we needed for exceptional cases offer a response uh, uh, made up of compassion and solidarity uh, in their case. That's good. Palliative care? Oh, I think you can help us. Um, situate uh, assisted dying as it's provided for in the Act uh, along the spectrum of palliative care and the different kinds of interventions that one can imagine? Well, I suppose the most traditional definition of palliative care, the one in the public perception, uh, is often interestingly associated with cancer care. 
and people have came into the system, they got all their chemotherapy and their radiation, and there came a point where finally there was recognition that nothing could further be done, and they were passed on to the palliative care doctors who were there to relieve their pain. When you really think about that, that's a substantial failure of medicine. Because from the earliest moments, the notion of comprehensive understanding of your patient and alleviating suffering uh, marches beside the notion of curing disease. The game isn't curing disease, it's taking care of a patient. So we backed ourselves into a kind of corner. And now we're trying to back ourselves out again. You know, oncology has, and I'm an oncologist, uh, oncology has grown to the point where we're now starting to encompass notions of suffering identification, if you will, and the relief of suffering earlier on, and managing a t continuum of care. But it wasn't that long ago, and we still had examples of patients who'd be in a hospital, say with lung cancer, and they'd be treated full bore with radiation and chemotherapy and all sorts of things, and they were clearly getting worse in everybody's eyes, except maybe the oncologist who said, I'm gonna try one more thing. And then when that didn't work anymore, we had a terribly debilitated, disheartened, suffering as much from treatment patient, and we said, okay, over to the morphine guys. And that left patients terrified. It really, really did. And I think we're carrying that burden to today. I'm not a palliative care physician, but I've been involved in palliative care for a long time. And this is, in a good palliative care unit, the questions about assisted dying or whatever you want to call it, very rarely come up. Where you see it is where people haven't had that kind of help establishing a perspective, getting their supports. When you think about the court cases that have come forward, of course, they're neurodegenerative. All right, and that's another kind of story. So the philosophic issue really is, what does the society do when you identify a very small number of problems you can't solve, mm -hmm. right? And there's a risk on either side of that equation. If you make the decision to uh, change the rules, change what's a fundamental societal rule that you can't actively end someone's death, then you have to think of what are the consequences of doing that, having made things e easier for a very defined set of people. On the other hand, if you decide not to do it, if you hadn't come forward with the legislation, if Quebec hadn't come forward with the legislation, we have the consequence of people whose suffering may not be adequately relieved. So that comes up against the moral wall, but the way I would go about saying that, all right, you're going to make for this legislation. We have to be as explicit as we can be in, in territory in which it's almost possible, impossible to be explicit except in the situation and make a decision for an individual patient. Okay, we're going to do this or we're not going to. But the piece for me that is the real benefit down the line is what do you do after? What do you do to learn from each and every circumstance in which that's happened. You know, in medicine, we have this long tradition of the morbidity and mortality conference. And we'd get together on the ward, at, and, and we'd look at cases that had gone badly and said, what can we learn about them? It seems to me that for this very marked exception to traditional societal thinking, right, that as your legislation is partially set out, uh, both at the local and, if you will, at the societal level, you're looking at each and every circumstance and saying, did we, in fact, do what we should have been able to do to relieve that suffering? If we didn't, how do we modify the things? So, in effect, the real purpose of the act could be interpreted as to make the need for this gesture um, obsolete. And we have an, an, an example of that in Canada going back to about 84, 86, when some of you may remember um, uh, Dr. Gifford Jones and the uh, very public fight to legalize heroin in Canada. 
the argument being that you know, morphine didn't work. And the real story was we weren't using morphine properly. And after a lot of toing and froing, uh, complex legislation was set forth. Heroin was made available in a restricted way, but coupled with a very intense education program. And three or four years later, uh, the supplier of heroin uh, communicated to the federal government, I guess it was, and said, you know what? We're not providing this anywhere. There has been no demand. Why? We changed the way we started to approach palliative care. It was an enormous transition. We're not all the way there yet. And I think what you and, and the legislation do is provide another lever in that direction. I've also heard, I mean, I'll, I'll turn to Veronique, I've also heard actually the opposite story, the suggestion that the act would trigger negative outcomes for palliative care, that it would uh, bring people to think immediately of assisted dying, not to consider the steps that could be taken before, that resources might be taken away from palliative care units. Are you worried that this might be the perverse effect of the legislation? In Quebec, we don't have to abord it that way. In Quebec, we didn't approach it in this way. We have a much more global-wide uh, approach. There were a number of other um, things that were done at the same time when we introduced the law, the the, the bill. We think uh, of uh, the um, the Netherlands or Belgium, where legislation has also been presented. We, we saw uh, also an, uh, an augmentation in access to palliative care. So the literature shows us the opposite. The public debate, the public conversation around the end of life, the idea of exchanging uh, and having a real debate, a public debate in the public square around these questions brings a lot of interest, uh, shines a lot of light on the issues of the, uh, around end of life. And so the, the whole society becomes involved, uh, becomes involved also in the positive effects for palliative care and improvement in that area. And I didn't see anyone in all of the hearings we held who were dreaming to have, you know, to use uh, assisted uh, dying. Even the great activists would say to you uh, that they, they would dream of dying in their sleep. Uh, and so but, but what they do wish for is that if the worst case scenario happens, a bit like uh, an emergency exit, that that possibility exists, that it be there in, in real time, but also during this, the illness itself, so that they know that if that were to happen, there would be that option available to them. And that is also a factor that helps their, their own mental health, their own state of mind, their own peace of mind. And so I think for doctors, this is something enormous to wrap their minds around. But what we see in the population, for most people, it's not such a huge thing to go beyond that um, barrier, to go take that step, because they have, many people have accompanied people dying. They have seen circumstances, they've seen slow increments, sometimes large increments in, in morphine and other forms of sedating people. I'm not saying that it's the same thing, but they have witnessed, they've seen that for them, in their understanding, these are things that also lead to death, even if, of course, morphine and increasing its doses don't lead directly to death. We understand that. I'm not saying that. But that there is, nonetheless, all kinds of circumstances of, of um, supports and aid that is, uh, that is offered in the last days of life. And there's a certain lack of comprehension. Why are some things so correct from a medical point of view, but that um, a suicide or, the, or, or, or medical help for dying would not be allowed? So f for the average Joe on the street, the, the uh, putting yourself in the place of the, uh, of the, the person who's accompanying, often this whole discussion on values, they feel there's a certain hypocrisy involved. And that explains a little bit of a, a difference in terms of where, the, the, where some doctors are on this issue who are working on palliative care and who understand all the nuances and the general population who perhaps might be somewhere else. So we need to take this, this into account. And the other thing I wanted to say is that if in 30 or 40 years science has reached a point where it's obsolete, then we can change the law. You know, it's a law is made for a particular moment in time. I know there are a lot of people who are, who fear this, and they say, on the on the contrary, by introducing this lies this law, we're opening the doors a little bit more, and then they'll be open wider and wider. But a law is belongs to a certain time, a reality in a certain moment in history for a certain need, 
And of course, it can evolve in one way or another. And it's not fixed. The number of laws that we change every year, uh, modify every year, prove that. So I'm not saying this law is now fixed in time on one side or the other. Harvey, est-ce que nous jouons un peu avec les mots? C'est-à-dire, est-ce qu'il y a des différences qualitatives entre différentes choses qui mènent à la mort? Look at the spectrum of, of uh, medical responses and choices also made by the patient. One can move from withholding treatment or refusing treatment to withdrawing treatment that's already begun if it's life sustaining, to assisted suicide through the prescription of lethal drugs to the patient that the patient would take himself or herself, all the way to direct action by the physician that will provoke the the death of the patient. Is there a qualitative difference between all of these things? Is there a line to be drawn somewhere here? Well, I, I think there's a line of sorts. And, and you articulate it very well with those four steps. If you look at the first two, withdrawal of support or someone who um, decides they don't want to have treatment, what they're re really saying is let the natural processes move on. Let them play out. Uh, we're all going there someday. So let them play out and, and uh, keep me comfortable while I do that. When you take the next two steps, you are crossing a kind of line which is quite different from discon disconnecting the, the respirator. All right? If you disconnect the respirator, then the natural process is this person couldn't have breathed beforehand. Mm -hmm. all right? But if you now say, OK, they're breathing all right. They're not dependent on technology to stay alive, but they are suffering and they want us to depart from the natural process. That is a line that uh, causes a lot of difficulty for people going back from the, to the days of the Hippocratic Oath, which says, we respect the end of life. We respect the natural processes that are there. We understand that they're not always smooth and easy and clean and simple and, you know, like good movies, not bad movies. Um, but that's our limit, all right? That's, if you will, the ultimate humility of a physician who says, I can only do so much, but I will keep you comfortable. And what makes some physicians really uncomfortable, apart from, if you will, religious or moral things, which I don't think we want to go to, it's the feeling that this is very different than anything I've been mm -hmm. asked to do. Uh, I'm happy, happy isn't the word, but I can turn off the respirator because I understand I'm only allowing thus a natural process to take place. So I think there is that kind of uh, difference. This is very important because it's true that legally, Medically, there's a big difference between uh, unplugging someone from a respirator versus administering uh, a medical assistance in dying. You know, though, that there have been cases, there have been witnesses who have come to our hearings. I remember uh, a Monsieur Theriot whose wife was 40 years old and she was on a respirator. And the process with the uh, spouse, with the kids, with the doctors to decide uh, that this was the point, that they had had enough, it took many, many months. It was a process that was very important, very uh, charged, very difficult. It's not um, mundane. And for some people, for citizens who are not lawyers, who are not doctors, the line is very tenuous. And they don't think in terms of the natural sickness is going to follow its course. For someone who's 25, which was tw for someone who's 40, who's someone who's 60, who's going to stop dialysis, who's going to unplug a respirator, but who could live much longer if they were still plugged in or was still following the treatment, versus someone who is at the very, very end of life and for whom they only have two or three or four weeks left. And we say to that person, no, unfortunately, it's not possible to shorten your life, even if you have suffering that you find intolerable, because from a medical point of view or a legal point of view, we cannot. Of course, everyone understands that these two cases, these two things are not the same. But for people who are sick, the idea, this, the sense of all of this is very 
it's very difficult to establish it. Why would this, why would society say yes? On the one hand, there's no problem. It's been recognized for many years in the civil code for 25 years, the possibility of stopping all treatment, no matter what age. Um, we have cancer, we have 80% of getting out, but we don't want to take uh, chemotherapy and radiation. We can, we can say no. But why is somebody at the very end of life who is suffering extremely cannot also have as assistance to die? These are dilemmas and situations if, that, that people, the average person in the street, who, who we also have to represent as legislators, as, as politicians, uh, we have to take them into account. Harvey. Intervention. Uh, w one response is the uh, fundamental principled response that says under no circumstances with this kind of direct intervention by a physician to put uh, someone's life to an end be acceptable under no circumstances. And then another response is a prudential response mm -hmm. which suggests that leaving aside this very difficult moral question, if we're going to go in the direction that is taken here and that the Supreme Court suggests uh, is now the constitutional requirement in Canada, we need to have some safeguards and there are no ways to actually build up the safeguards to guarantee that there will not be any abuse or that we won't slide down the slippery slope. Do you think we can set up some parameters that would make this a bit more acceptable? Well, you're just going to have the anxiety on the other side of the equation, all right? You're going to, instead of the anxiety of, you know, maybe someone is going to suffer longer than they need to suffer, we're going to translate it into an anxiety that maybe people will suffer uh, less and treatment will be less offered and people will be less supported. So you're trading one anxiety for another. And I'm not sure that's as well understood as it might be. But I wanted to come back, Veronique, to a couple of things you said. Um, you talked about people in the very last days of their life who, in effect, say, hey, I know I'm dying in, in a week or two week or th weeks or three weeks. And, you know, why can't we make the decision to end this, you know, now? And you talk about the complex, time-consuming, but very valuable discussions around families and concerned others around those decisions. Now, that's going to be no different than withdrawing life support from a ventilator. You know, it, that's the same conversation, that's the same angst, and it'll have different manifestations because now you're, you're offering, you know, a, an actual active gesture. But you phrase that in terms of those kind of cases. Yet, in fact, the cases that drove the legislation were people with a much longer horizon. You know, Sue Rodriguez, uh, and, and, and uh, the current case were people who weren't dying of cancer. They had neurodegenerative diseases and the horizon was very long. Or let's put it this way, a lot longer than three or four weeks. So the case you make about ease it earlier is quite different than the circumstances that drove the interest. So help me reconcile those. Oh, moi je pense que les deux. Uh, C'est sûr que ce pas uh, juste it's not just people who are two or three weeks from dying, although those people also came to our hearings. We also heard from them in terms of prolonged agony. We shouldn't minimize those cases. They're also important. Uh, you know, some uh, pain that we can't control, there's no solution to. Uh, you know, um, uh, uh, permanent sedation and so on. For some people, um, this is something that creates a great deal of anguish, a great deal of anxiety. People can't sleep for two or three weeks because of it. Uh, I know a physician who is, is, saw a case of someone who was dehydrated and was, hadn't been sleeping for three weeks. So semantically and also medically, where do we make these, the difference? I think there's a clear difference, but for some people there isn't. There are people who have degenerative uh, illnesses, and that's also why I think that we need uh, this um, aid assistance in dying, and I think the Supreme Court showed as well in, in their ruling. And palliative care is necessary too, but for right now, palliative care is not sufficiently adapted to some of these degenerative cases, Bec so we, because the development of palliative care was 
uh, often very much uh, put the emphasis on cancer and on other conditions. I know there are other, people, other experts here who know a lot more about this than me, but many people said that we're starting to develop it more for degenerative uh, illnesses, but there is still a challenge. We still have to go further in that area. But those people also might find themselves in a situation of suffering, continual suffering, intolerable continual suffering in an irreversible situation and may want to have that possibility available to them so that they will not have to live for months. But I think this is a legitimate question that we need to find an answer to. We, How would you char characterize suffering? Is it pain? Is it... Uh, what would be the other words to expand on the definition of suffering that then, in a sense, would fall within the qualification that whoever is making this decision would consider? Ben, je dirais que c'est euh, de la douleur, c'est de la souffrance, c'est... It's pain, it's suffering, it's a form of agony of patients. Patients were telling us, uh, you know, that they were saying every minute that passes is like one hour. That's the state of discomfort, of pain, of anxiety that I'm in. There can be suffering that's also... Uh, moral that's existential and it can be enormous and very difficult to control without creating hallucinations or other effects um, very difficult effects to deal with um, for someone who wants to you know maintain a certain amount of consciousness and wants to have a relationship with their loved ones I'm in a state well I, I can't I can't say how you would qualify it scientifically I think doctors uh, particularly palliative care doctors and those who are suffering can explain it you know you talk to a patient they can explain one to ten and can explain it with many many words they can evaluate and make the difference between uh, a sore toe a sore tummy and a sore head or the suffering at the end of a cancer or the or the end of a de very degenerative uh, illness we've had we've had many many expressions of these feelings in our hearings how their loved ones lived this through through this agony as well that every minute is an eternity and excessively difficult to live through and to, to when you're to tossing and turning in your bed to lift yourself up even a little a little bit is difficult you're completely contracted you're completely doubled over it i think palliative care generally speaking today does deal with a lot of these situations but it's i think it's mostly suffering yes uh, but and also psychic and psychological suffering at the end of life. Bill 52 is a complicated piece of legislation. It, it sets up a number of conditions before any decision is made on an end of life uh, and uh, assisted dying. Um, I was reading a couple of weeks ago, and maybe some of you saw that in the National Post, report of a survey that outlined the uh, level of confusion among uh, healthcare professionals, physicians in Quebec about what's legal right now, what might be made legal after uh, the legislation comes into force, to the level of extreme confusion, honestly. Um, uh, and, and that raises the question how we're going to ensure that whatever conditions are set in the Act are actually going to turn into the results that you anticipated as part of the legislation. And conversely, I would say, if you read the decision of the Supreme Court uh, and its conclusion, you will find that the court found the criminal code provisions that prohibit assisted suicide are of no force or effect to the extent that they, and I'm reading now, prohibit physician-assisted death for a competent adult who clearly consents to the termination of life and has a grievous and irremediable medical condition, including an illness, disease, or disability that causes enduring suffering that is intolerable to the individual in the circumstances of his or her condition. Not easy to apply either. Those are very difficult standards. So I'm interested in hearing what both of you think of the actual implementation of this idea, the, the oper operationalization of the idea of assisted death, either in the legislative context of Quebec or in the more open-ended standard that I've just read from the Carter decision. I would like to say something about the survey because it's in 
credible. This survey is about the knowledge of physicians or, uh, and their knowledge of Bill, Bill 52, and it was carried out before the, uh, uh, the, before the bill was even presented. Not even before the debate, but before it was even presented in the National Assembly. So it's incredible that this survey has been published now, even though it was carried out in 2013. And the National Post is trying to say no one in the health sector understands this bill. I was writing it at the time that this bill was, uh, that this uh, survey was carried out. Now, however, that having been said, we have seen some exaggerations and some hyperbolism in the media on both sides, the pro and the con, that use information in a somewhat, somewhat irresponsible way. So I want to just put that within its right context. But the other thing I would say is that, of course, nothing is perfect. And one of the big areas where we still have to do work, and I'm not there anymore doing this work, I'm not in the government anymore to be able to follow up on all of this and to put in place and to operationalize this law. But when I left, there were a, a number, uh, there were at least eight different areas that were people were working on. One that is fundamental, and finally, is yes, that nurses and doctors and social workers, first of all, know what the palliative care know what palliative care is, but believe it or not, even in the medical uh, context, even in the healthcare context, there are lots of people who don't know enough about it. But also the distinction between uh, different treatments, refusing treatment, uh, medical assistance with dying, and other, you, you'd be amazed uh, to, to know how many doctors don't know about sedation who just think that it's, you know, injecting morphine. All of these concepts in the past we realized during our work uh, were not unanimously understood within the sector by, by doctors. But I would say that the work we were doing for four years in Quebec, the law, the report of the commission, were also tools that allowed to inform the public and the healthcare professionals, but also to help these teams, help healthcare teams, to better understand. You know, for 25 years, you didn't realize that your patients had the right to refuse certain treatments. Not only do you need to know that, but you need, we need, you need to go further. There's a whole new step we need to take. So this is a, a fantastic opportunity to better uh, master all of these uh, concepts. I think it's going to be hugely difficult to implement for exactly the reasons you put out. Uh, whether or not that survey was done while you were writing the legislation or not, I sat down uh, a few weeks ago with a group of uh, uh, medical people and law students and the Privacy Commissioner in Ontario and the President of the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario, and they had homework in advance that so they dread the Supreme Court thing. They'd read the, the, you know, uh, your bill. They'd read a whole bunch of things. And in this group of people who, who did homework beforehand, there was huge confusion about what it actually meant, what the process was to be. And at the end of the day, uh, we sort of said, you know, everybody's focusing on a process here, and it's a process that isn't linked to really understanding what the outcome is going to be. And this goes back to that theme I did raise earlier on, that if you're going to do this, you're going to make a series of decisions, and the real moral hazard, the greater one for me, is the moral hazard of fine, you do this, and a certain number of people uh, come through that process at, at the end of a year, and, and we've assisted them to, to die earlier than they might otherwise have died, and nobody goes and says, okay, what did we learn for this? Did we do it right? Uh, did where all their needs met. We will have satisfied a process somehow, all right? We'll, we'll within all the ambiguities it, that the Supreme Court legislation leaves, and I, I dare say Bill 52 leaves, we'll have come up with a process, you'll have set up some adjudication committee, they're gonna do it, and then there's gonna be silence at the end. And we're not gonna know whether we've done this properly. And that, for me, is the greater moral hazard. Do you know at this time when you, when you withdraw a treatment, do you know if you're doing well? Do you know when, if, if all the support was given? Uh, do you know if people who are in palliative care 
ha really have a feeling of having been accompanied perfectly? I mean, all these questions are asked even now. So why all of a sudden uh, are, would they be asked in a totally new way uh, for uh, the medically assisted death? I mean, I think it should, these questions should be asked for all the end-of-life situations, no matter, w no matter what happens, uh, what would give comfort to person. I mean, that's the issue, and we have to improve the accompaniment of the people at the end of life, but I don't think we have to segment according to the fact that somebody has or not has recourse to this form or exceptional form of help, which is the medical assisted su uh, suicide. I or end of death, end of life. So uh, maybe uh, my um, I think that the fact that of having brought this discussion back in the public sphere could only help us. And thank God in Quebec, it's not the judge of the judgment of the Supreme Court that will have uh, shown the pathway because everybody in Canada doesn't have any choice because Supreme Court was, uh, Supreme Court has just indicated what people have to do. We at least have a couple of yards ahead of time and with a debate we've debated already in the civil code on all the questions of, of care, health care, and we now have five years of work and public consultation. So I think that that's a great plus that we have in respect to uh, for the good, the well-being of people. Of course, there's a process. What we're looking for is the wellness of people. That's the purpose. That's the main focus that has to be ours. Last question, Cappy, before we uh, open the floor to, to the audience, and maybe you can gather your questions uh, and, and we will pose them to the, to the speakers. So, I guess what you're both saying leads me to the, to, to the obvious question. Do we really need legislation? Could we not just trust the doctors and palliative care units to do the right thing? They've been doing it for quite some time. Legislation just sends strange messages about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable in society. Can we not trust them to do what they're supposed to be doing? Accumulate the wisdom that they normally would accumulate, teach one another? Right? Do we really need this? And then I might add, do we, do we really need a legislation in Quebec that might trigger uh, particular responses that will be different in other provinces? This is not a federal matter exclusively. It could be a provincial matter. We could have a whole range of legislation in the different provinces that would be quite different. So is it a bad idea to legislate in this case? I mean, coming from the dean of law, this may sound a bit strange. <laughs> but the, the, the skill of lawyers, as Veronique will know, is to figure out when it is that you should legislate and when you should not, right? So is this a case where we shouldn't, actually? Is this dangerous terrain? Well, like from the outset, we, 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 in Quebec we could have said that we especially don't want, as legislators, uh, stop on the question and that we would do like every in the rest of Canada or federal and find out that the, the courts tell us what to do. I was convinced that when I uh, tabled the motion that created the commission that on the contrary when it was a topic as sensitive as this and fundamental as this and touched all the uh, citizens uh, be, be, because uh, we will all have to face death one day. So I felt that it was important that the elected, that the elect Tours, uh, have their opinion uh, and, and I was much more of an opinion that it was a question of courage, a legislative courage that we had to therefore commit this discussion with people, into this discussion with people rather than being imposed by uh, the court decision. The rest of Canada took, made another choice, uh, they fine, but they're in the same situation we are and I would say according to me they're a lot less comfortable to having now, uh, let, after a year, they have six or seven months to try and come to some kind of legislation that will have established a consensus that the doctors, the nurses, the, the, the uh, moralists, the lawyers and the population will be able to all accept in a, such a short uh, time frame. So I'm very happy that we did what we did uh, in Quebec. And why? Would, would, did we have to legislate? Well, sometimes we, of course, Supreme now, the Supreme Court, we have to do what we have to do. What I think was a good idea for two principles. If we left this up into the hands of the private relationship between the patient and his or her doctor, then there could be problems of equity uh, because, of course, not doctors don't have the same values, don't have the same ways of dealing with the question of end of life, and therefore you see also a difference of philosophies. Or, uh, one goes to palliative, case, uh, palliative care, in other words, something different. Some want uh, care at the home. So it's not the patient then that has the last word in respect to all of this, the professional words. Some people said, look at, uh, some professionals will say, leave it in our 
our hands, when it's really, really bad, we will know what to do for you. The fact is that the answers that we had during our sur surveys were it's not always the same. And secondly, I think that for we for the, for, 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 for seeability, I think it's important for people to know what they can have or what they can't have in terms of health care at the end of their life uh, so that they can foresee how during their sickness uh, what uh, the, the, the end of life could look like. Just had not put their fingers in that soup. Well, I come, by the way, from a family of lawyers, and yes, I, th I think we'd probably be happier if they hadn't, but at the end of the day, you know, the storm will pass. Um, I don't think creating a piece of legislation will make this necessarily easier. Um, because to give you a very trivial, uh, trivial example, you do this and compare the availability of resources to someone uh, living, say, within a mile of where we're sitting today or in a small community in northern Quebec. And they have otherwise the same illness, the same suffering, and uh, the resources aren't there. Uh, in, in the smaller community for whatever reasons. And lo and behold, they start to call on the ending of life service, whatever it's called, because the community hasn't provided that resource to them. And that's a pretty frightening kind of way out. And, and uh, by legislating it, you put that, in a sense, right on the table and uh, turn it over to government and say, hey, you guys, you committed to a healthcare system, right? You were, you're going to be here for us, and guess what? Uh, I'm now. You've now given me the avenue to end my life because you know what? You're not going to provide that palliative care up in a small community in northern Quebec that I could get in Montreal. Now, Madam Premier or, or Veronique, when you're Premier, whoa, whoa, whoa. merci pour le vote de confiance. Hey, <laughs> you know, far worse things could happen. I don't know if we want to, to uh, talk, advise that somebody who's, who's wise uh, to do that. So, Cap, you turn the floor over to the audience. We have some uh, questions that people want to bring forward. I think we have some people who will gather the questions and bring them here. I'm sorry, I'm actually getting older and I'm deaf, and I really can't hear what you're saying. So. Well, bring it forward. Bring it forward. Someone will pick it up. Okay, so I have, uh, there are some people who are actually quite um, creative here. Let me start with a short question. With budget cuts in the health system, how can access to palliative care be increased from the current 30% availability? Okay. Well, first of all, 30% is not an adequate number. It's a number that has existed since the year 2000, so it was before the policy on palliative care. It's therefore before the significant development we've known in Quebec uh, for, for more than 10 years now, and it was before I think we have, since that figure, we have three times more uh, beds available, three times more houses for palliative care. It's a very significant development of palliative care in homes also, or at home. We have to know that there's been an important development given to, the over the last years, to the palliative care and, and targeted investment, I'd like to say, for the very first time. So is everything perfect? No, I would say that it's not perfect. But uh, perfect, in, surprisingly, I had a discussion with some experts of palliative care uh, and who said that the access was rather good and it was uh, it greatly improved. Now the question is, uh, now with everything that's happening, will palliative care uh, should they, or will they be cut? Well, we hope not. But I have a lot of exchange with the Minister of Health in respect to this, and who re repeats his commitment uh, that he's supposed to very soon uh, come up with an action plan for uh, the e existence of palliative care, as well as for the whole question of against uh, pain. Now, uh, but even if I'm very critical, and I don't want him to do any policy, but I, I, I am very. Uh, I critique the government uh, stance, but I'm quite confident and trusting in respect to this issue because it is implicitly linked to the Bill 52, and you know that, in view of all the uh, 
uh, electoral deadlines. Finally, it was a, uh, uh, it was accepted at 12, the twelfth hour when I said the government was adopted. Finally, with a new government, and it was the first law that has two names of ministers on it from two different com two different parties. So I think that there is a commitment on the for the part of the new government to have access to uh, palliative care. Veronique, I have one here for Harvey, so okay. I'm gonna. I, I'm going to turn that one over to you while I sort the questions for Veronique. Um, and why are most palliative care physicians against Law 52? They take care of these patients every day with passion and care. What would they propose as more acceptable legislation? Well, I don't want to speak for my uh, palliative care colleagues, and there are a number of in, in the audience who uh, can probably address this better than I. Uh, in the first instance, I have come to the conclusion that, from talking with many of them, that the problem is um, when seen from the real coalface, where this is really happening, is not the large problem that's perceived by some people to be in the community. Uh, that we have a perfect system? No. But that we have a whole means of relieving suffering in the broad holistic context whether it's existential, whether it's the suffering that patients who are coming to their end of their days and haven't resolved con family conflicts, whether it's pain, uh, they can manage them uh, quite well. Uh, I don't think they have a definitive answer, and I, I can tell you from uh, my conversations with a number of palliative care groups that the issue, even within those groups, can be deeply divisive. Our, our, individual palliative care physicians comfortable being part of that system. Um, to give an incomplete answer, we go back to my first sentence, and they say, when you're at the coalface, this isn't as large an issue as the much greater ones facing our healthcare system, the delivery of adequacy of care. And I can say this from a global perspective. You know, the ability to give the basic uh, meet the basic requirements to ease people's suffering is not just a Canadian concern, it's a global concern. And as you relieve those concerns, the, the sense of, oh my God, I'm going to be left alone, become less. And the palliative care people, I think, are closer to that every day, which is why I'm perceiving and I'm looking in the audience at a couple of my colleagues here and friends who, who are palliative care physicians. I hope I'm not representing uh, their perspective. Uh, so one, one quick question, maybe uh, Veronique can explain why um, medical aid in dying was chosen as the proper terminology as opposed to euthanasia, which people would recognize. Okay. Uh well, euthanasia, in fact, is a word that's used a lot, but as you know, that uh, through the tragic examples of history, is, is not linked up to the medical context, but nor that the request should come from the person who is sick. And that's something we didn't talk much about because I hadn't enough time to involve myself in details of those conditions. But of course, it's, it's the most important criteria is that at all time the request has to come from the person herself or himself for his himself or herself and by himself or herself. That's, for, that's why for us the expression was, was good. That's an expression we created, the uh, help in me, to uh, medical help to die. And it's the help that's the word, important word. Person who's asking for help, uh, to be helped uh, in respect to their pain at the end of life. And it's a medical context because the medical context is a continuum of care and, and, and is fundamental for the, the concept, which is not found in the expression euthanasia as such. Uh, raise the issue of vulnerable populations. Some have to do with disability, incompetent individuals and so on. Do you think that safeguards that can be imagined either in the shape that they've taken in Bill 52 or in some other shape can protect those vulnerable communities from abuse, or from stigmatization or being singled out in these processes? But, moi, je pense que... It's for both... I think that the uh, fundamental key here is that it's a request from the person herself or himself. So evidently, if we start saying we're going to eliminate all people who are cost too much to a healthcare system, because uh, that's something we hear from time to time during the work of our commission, we heard those kinds of comments, or, or with that, that could be horror stories. And so that's why 
That's not what the law says. The law says that we want to help and accompany people at the end of life cycle and that the person has to ask it herself or himself in such a way there's a process that is a very formal process to follow through first med doctor second doctor uh, the person that makes the person has to be apt to consent so all this is very present and what is interesting to note is that not only the legal experts in Quebec looked at this on the law in other words the, the report of the Commission and the law itself there had been a request made to the experts committee of lawyers they said that the law like the Supreme Court said the same thing in their decision, that laws would come and improve the protection of the vulnerable people. Because at the, now, there is nothing to protect uh, the people who are, are uh, vulnerable. Yes, we're opening the door to a new form of uh, help, medical help to die, and that's true. But at the same time, we're doing this particularly because there are people who are very suffering, who become very vulnerable at the end of their lives, and that we want to be able to offer them an answer. But also, in respect to the present situation, uh, where I would like to remind you that people can, uh, for a uh, sort of family member to have co continuous uh, sedation, can decide that we're going to stop a, a treatment or we're going to uh, unplug the uh, respirator. And right now, we, we want to clarify this, and uh, for medical health, to die, it would be much more public, uh, framed, surrounded, and uh, given with, with the criteria. People had protection before the Supreme Court decision because any form of assisted dying was illegal. All right, so that was a pretty profound protection, if you want to call it that, from a legal perspective. But let's, let's go to the bedside for a moment, uh, where the real action is. And uh, these are very subtle, complex conversations, and how much is independent view? And one of the tales I, I, I was told was of a patient who, um, you know, was contemplating continuous sedation and wanted to be, you know, out of it. And uh, his, he had two daughters. And after conversations with one daughter, he said, okay, I'll have the, you know, the sedation. And then the other daughter would come in and he'd have a conversation. No, I don't think I want to have the sedation. And it's not a simple notion of, of the patient as an isolated individual with complete autonomy and, and being able to, you know, to exercise that uh, independently and cleanly all the time. These conversations uh, are necessarily difficult, particularly for families that may not have, uh, you know, may have issues within the family at the time. Uh, they're difficult when there are choices and options around treatment. They're difficult when the, the level of suffering changes from moment to moment. So um, you're never going to get away from the vulnerability issue. I don't think this... Uh, um, Decision, you know, making making this act legal uh, removes the vulnerability. I, I don't. Th I think it shifts it, and and so I don't think we're a net gain on that. Um, what we've done is is uh, open an avenue, uh, a different av avenue of abuse than we currently had. So a number of the questions um, raise the uh, uh, question or context of sedation and highlight the fact that. Uh, currently, there may be uh, instances in which patients are put into deep sedation without nutrition and hydration. Uh, and some people ask, what is the difference between that and active intervention that achieves euthanasia? And then conversely, other people say, well, since that's available, why do we need something more that would really take us to another level uh, in, uh, in our response to end-of-life circumstances? So I guess the question is for both of you. And then one slight spin on this. One person is asking how sedation got to be in the act. Because as people know, perhaps there's a specific provision that addresses sedation as distinct from uh, aid in dying. OK. And that will be the last question. Cappy will close after this, I think. We're at 7.10. I'm following my orders very precisely. OK. La sedation palliative continue. Palliative, continuous palliative sedation is in the law because 
It's not something that's banal or trivial. So we became aware that there was a lot of confusion in respect to the concept, as I said earlier on. For some people, sedation, constant sedation was uh, morphine doses and all of that, whereas sedation, palliative sedation, constant, which is called terminal, uh, and we we uh, when they ask we use continuous and not terminal because we were listening to the people in this process the the fact is to put somebody in a state uh, almost like a coma or a deep sedation uh, until the point where death occurs so often people at this moment they will not eat anymore uh, some people will still uh, be hydrated but we stop feeding if the which is rare but we hop we stop even sedation uh, sorry hydration uh, and what happens with this in some cases uh, this la might last long so this is something that we is is less reflected on for people who have degenerative sicknesses so people might have for what, many months to live so they do we say that to that tell that person stop feeding yourself to uh, and then you're going to become a candidate a potential candidate to some kind of palliative continuous continuous palliative uh, sedation then we'll be able to give you the the only care the only possibility is there for you in view of the state of suffering that we can't control at this time so it's for that because that's very complex. It's also for something for the uh, families. The family might consent because presently uh, the, the, they, there be a substitute consent, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, we, we thought that this would be something that would require certainly a consent, a specific consent, and uh, we give expl clear exp explanations. So that's why we said there has to be a written consent because we felt that it's something that it's not trivial, and to know why. Uh, this is not sufficient. Well, I think that with the example of the degenerative sicknesses that I just explained, but also because many, for many people, this is something that challenges them and makes them excessively anxious to think that they're going to be put asleep without waking up until death arrives and that their family will be there uh, at their side during two days, four days, eight days, 12 days, they never know. And so this is something that is not in conformity to certain uh, uh, will, to the will of some, per some persons uh, and in respect to some kinds of sicknesses. This is where the uh, legal and medical worlds have different perspectives. Um, legal world, I think, quite appropriately tries to articulate, you know, distinctions. Uh, and as an oncologist, as physicians, as palliative care physicians, we appreciate that there aren't black and white distinctions. So to give you an example of, of continuous sedation versus, if you want to call it, the unassisted natural process, uh, you will often encounter patients who in their last days, as we would say, lapse into unconsciousness, lapse into a coma. All right, that's, if you will, a naturally occurring form of continuous sedation. And what happens when that happens? Well, they stop eating, and the normal protective mechan mechanisms, for example, of coughing to clear your lungs and other things slowly cease. And so whether it's pneumonia, which has always been known as the old man's friend, is what takes you away or something else uh, it happens, that's the natural course of events. My sense of continuous sedation is that, in effect, it aids and assists almost the same kind of process. Because when you have continuous sedation, you're not going to be having your secretions drained, and all of the same kind of things happen. So I think here is uh, the case of making a distinction when, in fact, there isn't a distinction. Uh, what we're really trying to do uh, is uh, ease people's, uh, all of our ultimate uh, departures from this life uh, in a way that um, uh, minimizes, I'm going to say that minimizes suffering, to use an overused phrase, not only by the way for the patient, but for those who are important to the patient in their world. And that's the broad construct. Uh, that I think we need to think about. So it goes right back to the earliest part of our discussion this evening when as we, you know, live our life journey, you know, as Ecclesiastes would say, there's a time for this and a time for that. 
and it's the journey. And what we're obligated to do as physicians from infancy through death is to play a role in making that journey better. And end of life is a piece of that role. And um, uh, I think we've got to continue driving at it, and, and, and I really do mean it to say that the legislation you've put on the ground and then the further uh, move of the, of the Supreme Court uh, is a driver for our health care system to say, hey, wait a minute, we're taking a, we're, we're respons we've taken on responsibility for, if you will, the wellness trajectory of people throughout their lives. And we've got to stand back and, and look at ways to make this better in the face of extraordinary technologies that have come our way. We weren't having this argument, you know, um, uh, 100 years ago, before we had antibiotics, before we had ventilators, before we had the chemotherapy drugs. But now that we have these really, really powerful tools and we've charged in and we've started using them in ways that maybe are technologically in, ahead of our moral and societal ways to figure out how they work, uh, that's where we've got to go, have work to do, and the focus really isn't on the last moments of life and, and, and do we allow a mechanism that allows physicians or their surrogates or somebody to end it sooner. Say, wait a minute, have got to look at this whole trajectory. And that's education for us, it's education for our physicians, it's, it's, it's uh, and, and a real challenge to government which has taken upon itself to be the protector of our wellness and is confronted by the fact that this juggernaut of, of uh, extraordinary medicine has in some ways gotten a little bit ahead of us. So um, I commend you for, for what you've done. You're, it's an extraordinarily brave thing to do, especially in the view of conversations I've had with some major political leaders. Um, I think it's a way step. I don't think it's a solution. I think that might be actually the perfect point to end this conversation. I'm still holding maybe two dozen questions that were not raised and uh, you'll be happy to uh, know that there is a reception out there and you can corner our speakers and really ask your question if you have to have an answer tonight. Um, otherwise, um, just join the reception and uh, be merry. And on this, I turn the floor over to Dr. Cruz. Thank you very much. I think we've had an extraordinary evening. Uh, Harvey mentioned Ecclesiastes. Uh, one of my very favorite uh, things from Ecclesiastes, sayings from Ecclesiastes is for of the most high cometh healing. Uh, that was actually over the door of the Vanderbilt Clinic in New York where Sylvia and I trained. And it's something that's never let me, left me. I think what we're participating in is a continuing dialogue that society is having with itself. Uh, we're engaged in an evolution of attitudes. And um, it's important that these things be discussed. Uh, if we look at it in the terms of, for of the most high cometh healing, uh, my personal feeling is that the Supreme Court decision and Madame Yvonne's very wonderful law, are, are not involved in killing. I frankly think they're involved in healing uh, in the sense that our palliative care physicians have taught me about healing. Uh, I'm sure many people will disagree with me, but, uh, but that's, that's how I feel, uh, and I think it's important that people say how they feel in society. Uh, Margot Somerville taught me that. Uh, so on your behalf, we just have to thank the panelists uh, for their very wonderful contributions, for participating in a civil discourse on very difficult issues. Uh, and uh, I'd like to present on behalf of all of us uh, some tokens of our appreciation. And I think we would be grateful if you would all thank our panelists. Now, their uh, reception, turn left, 
it's in front of Moise Hall. We would be delighted to see you all there. Uh, and uh, please hand in your headsets so that you can get your IDs back. And uh, thank you all for coming.